Hello everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, Working Faster and Smarter in a Digitally Transforming World with Five Essential Capabilities. My name is Teresa Resick and I'm the Director of Market Intelligence Programs here at AIM. And AIM is your host and producer of today's event. And with me today are AIM President Peggy Winton and Chris Loy from Konica Minolta Business Solutions. And Konica Minolta is the underwriter of today's webinar and we thank them very much for their support. And thank you for taking the time to join us today. As we get started, I just wanted to share a few tips for participating in today's webinar. By joining our event live, you can resize the different windows you have in front of you. Um, I encourage you to open up the, the group chat, and that way you can message with each other and also with a few of us here at AIM. Um, um, there's a lot of great resources that we have out there uh, to, to share with you, and I encourage you also to uh, click on those resources and uh, take advantage of the case studies and other cool reading that's there. Um, please ask questions of our speakers throughout our time today with the Q&A feature, and we'll do our best to get to as many of them as we can um, all later in our webcast. I do have a survey set up, and I would greatly appreciate your feedback, and that is in, also in one of the links across the bottom there. And I do truly value the, the feedback that you give and to let us know how we did today. This webinar is being recorded, and it will be posted to AIM.org's Resources Webinars page in just a few days. And now to introduce the speakers we have with us today. Uh, Peggy Winton is President of AIM, and Peggy has over 30 years of program, product, and business development experience. And she is responsible for the strategic, technical, and business direction of AIM. Peggy believes that marketing and technology are converging and moving to the forefront of the business in order to deliver the ultimate customer experience. With this, businesses need to adapt to a world that has shifted from physical to data, technology, and automation. And uh, I'm also very happy to have Chris Loy joining us today. And he's the Business Solutions Managerial Leader with Konica Minolta Business Solutions. And Chris is a motivated, analytical, passionate leader with more than 15 years of solutions management experience. He delivers strategic leadership in IT, engineering, and enterprise content management, along with an array of other projects. Chris has deep expertise and thought leadership across disciplines of document content in such areas as mortgage, oil and gas, human resources, accounts payable and receivables, manufacturing, healthcare, government, and other business processes. So right now, I'm going to turn things over to Peggy Winton to begin our discussion today. Peggy? Thank you, Teresa, and welcome to you, Chris. If we're talking about working faster and working smarter, we have to talk about digital transformation. And yes, that's a term that you've heard over and over again, and many of you uh, may hope you never hear it again, um, because it means a lot of different things to different people, and as such, it's uh, come to mean uh, nothing to some of you. But we think that digital transformation is not just about doing different things. It's really about doing things differently, and the path there. Uh, isn't paved by just digitizing a single process or adopting a new technology. It's really about accelerating business activities through the flow of information. And why is that? Because it's designed to realize the true promise and the, the driver from which everything else flows when we talk about digital transformation, and that is understanding, anticipating, and redefining your customer experience. And that can mean both your external and internal customer. If information is the currency and the fuel for that, how do we really optimize it? I would suggest that many in this industry have spent the last several years trying to hang on to information. And I think it's now it's time really to set it free um, to fuel those customer-facing applications because that's where we're feeling the demand and that's where we're feeling the pressure. And that's where um, it's the business, uh, not just IT, that is pushing for a lot of new development when it comes to technology. So speaking of fuel, 
Uh, Chris and I, over the next few minutes, are going to be giving some context to our discussion with examples of process optimization efforts in energy uh, and oil and gas and things like uh, land and contracts management. So those of you in that industry will know what we're talking about. And those of you that aren't, uh, hopefully you can see some of your own processes in what we're going to talk about. The objective in all of this is to free all of us, free our workers from that drudgery, from the manual tasks, so that we can focus on high value creation and delivery of products and services. Again, after all, the true digital transformation leaders are those organizations that make it easy to do business with them. So easy, I think, in two ways. The product or the service itself should in some way simplify or enhance your customers' lives. And they want to consume that in different ways. So we ought to be able to deliver that in the ways that they want it. So, Chris, uh, when it comes to uh, energy market segments, tell me and tell our audience about the places where back-end processes can be significantly improved. I would imagine there's a fair amount of paper or has been in the past. So, where are you seeing the improvement? Thank you, Peggy. Industry, from the energy standpoint, as most of you know, has three sectors. There's the upstream, midstream, and downstream we're seeing organizations you know, leveraging technology for those time-consuming, repetitive tasks. It basically frees up those knowledge workers to focus on those value activities regardless of where you fall in that market sector. You'll be impacted by this digital transformation journey. If you're joining us today, you might ask, what about me? How about my organization? I'm not in energy. Maybe you're in the public sector or healthcare sectors. You, too, are impacted by this digital journey. Well, and, and nobody said it would be easy because the volume and the velocity and the variety of the information that we're all dealing with, you know, we got to manage it, we got to store it, we got to protect it. Well, that volume has long since exceeded our ability to even marginally keep pace. I know that there's, uh, I think it's the University of California at Berkeley always tries to put a size on it, and, and I think it's in the zettabytes now. Um, you know, that's unfathomable, and it's, uh, it, it's hard to even imagine. We, we asked you all, um, and thank you all for taking part in the regular research that we do. We asked you to look at your own organizations and just give us an estimate of what kind of growth you think you're going to see in, in two years when it comes to the information sort of coming into your organization and swirling it around. And you said that it would grow from X, whatever it is today, to more than 4X. That's, that's a lot. That's, that's an awful lot. So, uh, again, Chris, I expect that the oil and gas customers you serve have a pretty good flow of information in and out of their organizations and probably across their supply chain, their, their value chains. Can you put that into some perspective for us? Absolutely. We're seeing organizations with vast amount of content and data we we're working with them to take that unstructured, if you want to call it, content and information and move it toward a more structured process and solution. Here on the slide, you have ConocoPhillips and Enterprise Holdings, which is the parent company for Enterprise Rental Car, with 30 terabytes and 50 terabytes of data, respectively, of content that they're migrating to a one-platform solution. These organizations, you know, they're facing similar to what you are today, these challenges in moving towards this platform to manage the data and the content in lieu of what we call those dreaded shared drives or departmental drives within their organization. You know, I'm always struck, Chris, by uh, all the different uh, partnerships and, and you know, uh, brands that we've come to know. You don't realize um, what other subsidiaries they own, and suddenly they're involved in different businesses as well. I mean, sure, you can see the connection between uh, a gas uh, exploration or, or producing company and uh, the cars that run on them. But, um, yeah, think of, think of the complications and the, and the different different business models. So thanks for, for pointing that out. There's so many other uh, 
sort of hidden uh, uh, co-ownership that, that we don't know about. So we said that this kind of volume to manage it is hard enough, but add to that the nature of most of it that we're dealing with. Again, we asked you all, um, look in your organizations and look at that big volume of information. What percentage of that is unstructured, meaning that it doesn't fit tidily into a database or it doesn't have a predefined form? Think of a, a contract or a conversation or even a semi-structured invoice or a form. And you told us that it's 60%. Now, this is something we've talked about a lot at AIM. And some would say, well, the lines between structured and unstructured are, are becoming blurry. I think they are where your average worker and your ad average customer is concerned. But for those of us who are trying to manage this volume, to manage it at scale is where Chris's comment comes into play. How do you take unstructured make it more structured so that you can leverage the benefit and the heavy lifting of things like machine learning. So, Chris, this rising tide of chaos and confusion we see is creating this demand for new information capabilities, management capabilities. They extend beyond what was a traditional enterprise content management belief uh, in this con one content repository or one system to meet all needs, maybe a bit of a pipe dream. So what are the key functions you guys are working on at Conoco Minolta to satisfy that emerging need to deliver content in context and give workers, give those users who are on the front lines of the customer, give them the information they need when and where they need it and in the best form for performing a particular business application. No, no pressure. What are you all seeing? <laughs> yeah, Peggy, what we're seeing is organizations delivering this one platform solution concept to provide that complete end-to-end -end functionality that complements the line of business application. We'll take a minute here and break that down in the next few slides. When you see that, it all begins here on the capture front end, right? They're leveraging RPA. We all heard that robotics process automation, and we'll talk about that a bit more here shortly, as well as intelligent capture, especially since the majority of our line of business applications has file format limitations. It allows you also to allow you to bring in bulk imports instead of documents one at a time within your particular process. Speaking of the process, it all begins there, right? That workflow that complements, not necessarily replaces your line of business application within your organization. However, it must have the flexibility to tweak for your wows, your ways of working change. What you do a year ago is not necessarily what you do today. It may not be what you do a year from now. Along with tracking, revision, and versioning, when you look at these silos of 4X beginning to grow, a lot of those are duplicates in there. How do you manage those? That's where revisioning, versioning control can come in. Maybe electronic signatures. If you're used to those traditional highlighting and, and post-it notes. You can do electronic notes, electronic highlights. And ultimately, it all needs to be user accessible to the end user. What do I mean by that? You can allow these profiles and views to be provided for each user based on their role within the organization. A lot of business applications we've noticed have those pre-built workflows, but the wows are the ways of working changing. So it's important to have those configurable forms to be able to do that within a given process within your organization. Bottom line, it's content-driven. This complements the data being driven by your line of business application. All that unstructured data out there on those silos, you need to have access to that, right? But see, you must be able to find what you're looking for, work closely within the organization to ensure that information is structured and configured to be able to easily locate the information. Bottom line, if you're not able to find it, why are you doing this? Well, why are you going through this transformation journey, right? You got to make it smarter and faster. Maybe your organization has such a large silo, you need the ability to search across those, those structured and unstructured areas of information and provide a comprehensive result. So we've seen Inside those graded hard drives, uh, technology out there to allow you to do that Google type search and present it to you as an end user within your organization. When you come to integration, uh, it must be seamless integration to those line of business applications for the users and the knowledge workers to access across those contents and documents relative to their role within the organization. You may be listening today or part of this and you're an ERP accounts payable and you've got Workday or PeopleSoft or maybe JD Edwards 
loss is delic. A platform is agnostic, right, on the ERP side. If it's human resources, you could have SAP success factors, or if you have a customer relationship database that you need to integrate to, right, Salesforce, Microsoft Dynamics. You're in healthcare, it could be Epic or Allscripts. Uh, when you're looking more towards the land management system for oil and gas space, Quorum, P2, LandPro, Wolfpack, Inertia, and there's a number of others out there as an example, you need to have a platform that's easily integrated for the line of business application, ultimately for ease of use by the end user. When you look at storage, we can't get away from that, right? We've got compliance issues, whether it be local, state, or federal requirements. The solution must provide electronic document retention policies that we're all accustomed to from the physical records. Physical records may need to still be tracked as well. So electronic and physical electronic destruction letters need to be tracked from a compliance requirement. Uh, bottom line, when you come down to an end-to-end -end solution, we need to look at also those, what I call those virtual data rooms, that sharing collaboration securely for external parties. We see that a great deal in the oil and gas industry, especially for divestors and acquisitions within the energy sector. I really like that, uh, Chris. I'm going to go back one slide because I think this is a good way for our listeners to um, think about how they would begin to build their own digital workplace. And for years, AIM's own um, motto or slogan when we described enterprise content management was capture, manage, store, preserve, deliver. And I think this is just the modern uh, modern version of that, including process, of course, and realizing the reality of the uh, content migration and integration needs. And of course, we don't do this just for the heck of it. Uh, we do it to extract um, value and intelligence and we want to be able to measure that and uh, do what we have to with it. So thank you. I think this is really, really useful. And you all told us, oops, going to go through this again. That's okay. We'll make it real quick. You all told us that um, you see an alignment between broader digital transformation goals and building a digital workplace. Obviously, if we said that digital transformation leaders make it easy to do business with, and if easy means that you need the ability to very quickly be creative and innovative in terms of the product or the service itself, and you need to have your house in order to be able to deliver against that, then no wonder. And this is really what we talk about when we um, talk about a need to modernize our infrastructure. And I don't like using that word because people think of architecture. It's really your ecosystem. And when it comes to core operations like human resources, accounts payable and receivable, things like contracts management, division orders, and that certainly applies for what we're talking about today in energy, oil, and gas, um, a digital workplace is really, really important. So we think that when we're trying to define what it means for a, a modernized approach and a, and a true digital workplace, that it takes five essential capabilities. And the first one, uh, Chris mentioned the dreaded silo, the dread, dreaded S word. Let's face it, we all have them. And these are not things that just happened yesterday. They've been built up over time. Uh, in way too many of our organizations, our content repositories are almost creating a situation in which we as knowledge workers have to act as human system integrators. We're copying, we're pasting from where our information's coming in or where it's stored to where it's needed. And um, you don't want to do, what do they call it, swivel chair uh, work. Um, you don't want to have to stop what you're doing and uh, uh, invoke a completely different process. I think most organizations understand the problems created by that, um, and they recognize the need to do something about it. So we asked you all, what do you think the most important reason for trying to undertake something like that? And you said it was to get the flexibility and the agility that we need in order to serve our customers. And remember, we're talking about internal uh, as well as external. 
You know, uh, Chris mentioned the shared drives, network drives. Um, that's where most of the siloed information is. So take a look and think about that. If we at AIM can do it, and we have, we've long since uh, moved off of uh, local network uh, shared drives um, to a complete cloud-based um, collaboration and document management set of tools, you can too. Um, those uh, things have come a long, long way uh, in terms of maturity, and you can set different permissions, et cetera. So take a look at the dreaded shared drives as maybe a really good place to start. So. Chris, um, we talk about um, having so many disparate sources of information and, and potential sources because if true differentiators is knowing customer and getting insight, um, having access to that in a way that's really easy and seamless to the user seems pretty important. So how, how is that done uh, among your customers and, and with your solution? Absolutely. It's quite important to be, be seamless and have that agile or agility approach within a given solution, especially for the end user. When you look at that shared drives that you mentioned and all that unstructured data, that all is brought into the platform from an enterprise content standpoint. That's what we call, as you know, historically that back file, that historical archival content what you see here is a breakdown of how the day forward and current process is with any back office business unit, regardless of the industry that you're responsible or you're involved in. The top portion of the slide there is the platform. The bottom is the line of business application. It all starts with the content driven of capturing that content. And regardless of the file format, we see a great deal right now of incident management, which are video files. You're able to track those and escalate those from an incident standpoint. Then you want to leverage at the same time your RPA, your robotics process automation, maybe intelligent capture technology to automate that process on the front end. We've all used OCR tools, right? OCR hasn't changed for the past 15 plus years. It's what technology and organizations and software is doing with that today, right? You want to capture that from an indexing and classification with metadata tags. Uh, for example, if you're in the land leases, you want to grab maybe the lease number and or the agreement number. If it's a division order, maybe the owner number. If you're in accounts payable, maybe the purchase order number, maybe that's on the invoice or the vendor ID. You want to leverage the source of truth at this point, which is a line of business applications. So we're catching those primary keywords, right? And bringing in those relevant other attributes and keywords or index values to complement the indexing. Not redundant, but primary. Leveraging the source of data, which is a line of business application, and the content source of truth is the platform. Once it's structured and ready to go, from an automation management process needs to take place. And an ERP, for example, the vendor name and PO number may match. If that's the case, you may want to post that directly to the ERP system. Uh, maybe even a given amount on the process flow. If it's over $5,000, maybe it needs to go to a manager for approval. When you look at IT invoices, maybe the CIO or the IT manager may need to approve that. Regardless of that, you need a workflow, one platform that allows you to change your business function as it's flexible within your organization. A process that, again, that complements that line of business applications. And finally, we cannot forget one of the most important uh, folks within this process, and that is the knowledge worker, right? The, the line of business application that we spoke of, regardless of where you're working, they need to have up to, uh, access to the documents and the content without logging into another application, a seamless integration to their line of business application within their organization. So that is a, a really good example of leveraging multiple sources of content, driving it to the line of business owners. Again, they're on the front lines of the customer. That leads to uh, uh, another driver around the automation piece and what's been viewed as sort of uh, citizen developing or um, kind of low code kinds of applications. And I think that's really exciting because in the first wave of process automation, and we talked about this at AIM for years, if we're, if we're talking about BPM, business process management, organizations focused on those large-scale, mission-critical, document-intensive processes. Think of things like document scanning at a major 
financial services institution or a major uh, oil and gas institution that's dealing with tons of regulations kind of documents. The capabilities back then um, tended to be expensive, uh, really complicated, and had long implementation cycles. But it didn't matter that much because the problems that those capabilities were solving were just considered so critical. And uh, the folks that owned it, um, largely in a basement somewhere, and I don't mean that disparagingly, um, they were specialists. Nobody else really understood. So the business tolerated it. But now, as the need for automation automation has moved beyond that core set of kind of initial ECM processes, organizations and the workers are really looking for solutions that have that agility. They're more easily deployed by the business themselves. And I always say, after all, who better than the process owners themselves to understand the process, understand what their um, customers are now demanding, and um, want to be able to take matters into their own hands, be empowered. They don't want to wait in a queue anymore for IT to get around to it. Uh, I think that's really a key driver for what's um, now called robotic process automation, RPA. And you you mentioned that, uh, Chris. So this is a good time to talk more about that and what some ideal targets are for it in some of the horizontal and vertical processes you see in the in the industry that you serve. I think you've got a, a quick case study uh, or a use case to share with us too, right? Yes, ma'am, I do. When you look at from a RPA, robotics process automation, and how it's being leveraged in a number of organizations, it's fundamentally we break it down into three areas. It's that basic RPA on the front end, those data entry points, extraction, and aggregate that information, the data from the systems, as long as those web portals, right? You're gathering the content without using a bot. Then you got the intelligent RPA, and you say, well, now what? We leverage that RPA to automate processes on the front end, that unstructured data, along with pushing that data now to the line of business applications and maybe into a content platform. And then we're seeing it mature at this point from a true cognitive RPA, that human-like understanding decision of complex situations such as reading obligations and leases, maybe the provision, the paragraphs, regardless in a land lease, whether the content is located over the years, providing that data and information collectively to the knowledge worker for a process decision with a given organization. So it's maturing quite a long far within the application. When you look at the automation execution, when you look at that fundamentally, we'll break that down somewhat of a black art, if you want to call it, since that's a new buzzword, right? It's simply a bot that reads along email along with the attachment, a little more than what you see traditionally with a platform or a content solution that imports the email within the organization. The bot opens the attachment, it opens the attachment, and also it, it executes one of those manual repetitive tasks by pushing, in this case, the Excel data, right? Pushes out to an ERP platform, maybe. The same function can be applied line of business application, especially for those of you in the energy sector that has a land management system within your oil and gas departments. Followed by the next bot, we'll do a series of checks, right? It'll be developed in, from a point-and-click standpoint to be able to, and, and an ERP system, maybe the PO number, the amount, vendor information, all those checks and balances are in place. If that's the case, the task is completed. The line share of uh, invoices that need escalation will be escalated to a knowledge worker for NAT and an, anal an analyst and review process. Industry research has indicated that 20% increase in productivity will leverage an RPA in the workspace for back office processing. Let's look at a case study here by Deloitte, right? They had a joint venture accounting uh, challenge within a large oil and gas company. They had what huge high volumes of changes they need to add and delete within their organization from their joint venture process. They need to automate those purchase orders, generate those purchase orders. What they really realized very quickly, right, they were not constrained to a normal working day, even if it's an 8, 10, 12-hour workday by a worker. A bike can function and operate 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Ultimately, they quickly realized how to accelerate those cycle times, skills very rapidly, and automate those traditional, again, those manual repetitive process, in this case with a joint venture-related accounting tax. What that ultimately did, it freed up the 
finance department and resource to, again, focus on those value-added activities versus those time-consuming, repetitive activities within the department. So we've talked about that. We talked about breaking down the silos, and it's not just to um, have access, but it's also to get those things into the hands of folks on the front line. So our capability number three is to integrate content capabilities into the line of business application so that there's content is generating value in context. So we asked you about that, and um, the, that is what emerges at the very top of this list. You, you appreciate that need. Um, but again, uh, the rub there is that 54% of the information that's needed within a particular business application is, 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 is stored within the application itself. It's not within what would be considered a dedicated content repository. So we've got to be aware of that and, and of that change. You know, which one's driving it? And I would say that the business application probably contains some of the richest uh, information about the customer. Um, but it's not easy. You've said for 75% of you, this is not an easy task. So perhaps that leads us to our fourth capability, uh, transitioning to cloud-based content services might be uh, a way to uh, assist with that. It's, it's really becoming the next logical step forward. Um, for a digital transformation that ensures that your content is always available, always accessible and shareable. And this growing confidence is really kind of creating an emerging shift where business leaders and department heads are um, realizing that, you know, maybe these impediments to some of this effectiveness um, can be alleviated. And they're starting to look at the cloud as not just about storage and cost savings and the mobile access. They're actually thinking about how they can refigure processes to be cloud enabled. And I do always draw the distinction between lift and shift meaning lifting something that was uh, on local, on, on a desktop to the cloud, it doesn't always work. And um, this cloud first mentality may not always be right for everyone. So Chris and I both have a realistic um, uh, view of that, that you, you push as much to the cloud as you can. Um, and uh, the reality is that it can be a, uh, a hybrid world. So, um, but it is top of mind to you, and we've certainly seen a major, major shift in this as AIM has been tracking this for many, many years. You know, I find at the end of the day, Chris, that if you ask workers about the cloud, they don't care. They don't care where the cloud is. They just want um, they just want to be able to collaborate with people both inside and outside the organization. They want to work remotely with the same look and feel across both on-premises and the cloud. Uh, do you agree? And, and, and how do you all accomplish that, even if it's a, a hybrid solution? Absolutely, Peggy. Uh, obviously, as you mentioned, uh, traditionally they have the on-premise system, right, for many years. There's been a few cloud solutions out there. That being said, within the past 12 to 18 months, the majority of our new and even existing engagements, right, are adopting more of the cloud-based model, similar to what we see today with the number of platforms that are out there versus that traditional on-premise solution. When you look at this one platform solution, it only makes sense for an organization to re look real closely and review the option to do this in the cloud. That being said, Regardless of where your line of business lands within your organization, if it's in a premise space, maybe in Azure, maybe in AWS, we'll definitely see that hybrid solution as they roll out within given organizations today. And this takes us to the final, uh, last of the five capabilities. And we said it earlier, making use of machine and, and human generated content at Scale, and that's the uh, operative term right here, because traditional content management capabilities are 
really becoming almost commoditized and they're shifting from a source of competitive advantage to almost table stakes in a larger value proposition. And that proposition is what we've been talking about since we started, process automation and machine learning. And there's a major pivot underway uh, over the next two years from looking at content as a standalone priority, and that was really a throwback from the ECM years, and content as a key enabler of processes and analytics. So we all, you agree, but, you know, we still put the filter on there that the Information coming in is exploding, and the preponderance of it is in that unstructured or semi-structured form. So taking that in the machine-comprehensible data, that's one way to really leverage that and, and at the required size and speed to solve these problems and meet these demands. So, Chris, this is probably a really good time uh, to talk more about those demands uh, that you're seeing among your customers. And, you know, I think... Sometimes we, we overcomplicate things. I know there's a desire for simplicity and computing power at the same time. And I think that's why you all developed a single platform to accomplish the demands of Sabine and Chesapeake Energy and some other customers. So this is where the fun starts. So take us through some of that. <laughs> Absolutely, Peggy. What we're seeing is basically that single platform to manage that enterprise information, that one platform that we're talking about today a single place within the organization to secure their content, a single platform to configure those applications, and ultimately a single point of integration. Studies have shown the average time frame to procure and purchase a new departmental software solution is somewhere around 10 months. With the one platform solution, what it basically does is allow IT departments to build an enterprise solutions manager to build and deploy solutions faster than you can buy them, right? And as we know traditionally, Business units are trying to be attempt to be the drivers. However, there are times to procure the software. Obviously, IT and the deployment are behind. This allows, obviously, the business units to be more, I wouldn't say in control, but allow the business and IT to align together from a solution standpoint. When you look at a solution uh, from a success story, let's talk about today, Sabine, right? Sabine as far as an organization has been originated in 2007, they achieved a leasehold position in three key areas. They had approximately, what, 300,000 net acres. Some challenges with that growth within the organization. They had approximately 25,000 oil and gas leases, another 25,000 or so unique owner accounts, and along with 3,000 uh, jib and revenue records within the organization. <laughs> the case study indicated that from Sabine Oil and Gas, they had, from at least from a staff standpoint, six individuals working annually, approximately 2,050 leases within the organization, right? The processing time was approximately 120 days. When you look at the other land department division orders, they had nine staff members. So it's a total of 15 within their land departments. In this case, with division orders, they were processing approximately 2,600 documents within the organization. Processing time was 70 to 90 days. When they started breaking this down and looking for process improvements from the land of a pl one platform approach, they quickly realized the process efficiencies that we're talking about today. They went from six staff members to one. Not only did they reduce their overall staff and headcount, they were able to process their new leases increase by 10% from 2,000 to just over 2,200. And they also decreased their processing time from an average of 120 days to 75 to 90, which is approximately a 30% increase. When you look at the division owner side of the statistics, right, they begin with nine employees on their staff. They reduce it down to four. These knowledge workers obviously were rolled off to other tasks, not so necessarily terminated. So overall, when you look at this, there are 15 employees in the land department. Now there's five. When you look at the division owner statistics and break that down, it went from processing 2,600 documents with nine people to processing 4,000 with four, a 40% increase, something like that, with half the staff members or more than half. The processing time also decreased from 70 to 90 days to 30 to 60 days, approximately a 50% uh, reduction in the time of processing. Moving on, when you look at Chesapeake, we're going to look at them from a robotics process or intelligent capture on the front end, right? They had started out with 10 employees in 1989, and now they're well over 5,000. As we all know, with 
uh, acquisition and mergers and such uh, issues with overall capacity began to be a challenge. Multiple departments, multiple states, multiple locations. That was their challenge within the organization. So the solution, they had 34 initial batches that scaled to over 165 total batches in the organization. It basically served every department, whether it be accounting, whether it be the land and division orders lease, maybe even the midstream section for their pipeline and production and content within the organization. These two case studies uh, are proven in process improvements leveraging both RPA and the one platform approach within the energy sector to improve their back office processes within the organization. We got some additional resources. Uh, we've actually got the full case study over here for Chesapeake Energy. We just went through a couple of slides, about three pages worth. We also have other process improvements we see in the energy space from resources for oil and gas energy. There's uh, also information related to benefits of the one platform content management for oil and gas space. Regardless, again, if you need to streamline your division order process, you need to address some challenges and streamline the process and accounts payable, you need to track those leases, or even manage your contract life cycle, regardless if you're on the vendor or you're on the purchaser side. And then we have some literature in there referencing simplified oil and gas content within a given organization. Maybe even ask yourself uh, where you feel your organization falls within this journey, right? And what we would basically look at from the digital transformation journey in 2020. I don't know about you guys, but it's hard to believe that it's almost the new year. But maybe ask yourself, maybe your department, what are your top five digital transformation projects for 2020, right? And see what you can do today to leverage maybe this one platform approach or some data theory you relate to that Peggy's presented today, as well as maybe information intelligent capture on the front end, as well as robotics process automation. Teresa, we'll throw it over to you and our Peggy, and we'll take questions at this time. Yeah, um, thank you. If I'm listening to Chris Loy, uh, Conica Minolta, and just a couple of things just real quickly here. When he uh, shared with you all these really cool resources, they are also linked in the resources box to the right of the slide area. You can click on those links right now, and, and that's what will open in another browser tab. And you can download and, and read all that um, after our webcast today, or take the PDF of the slides, and these links are live in there as well. And also when Chris mentioned about you know, having you think about what are your information management projects, um, you know, feel free to, if you're aware of what they are right now, feel free to comment in here. And, and I'll go ahead and write a, um, Peggy and I will pull together a nice little uh, summation uh, blog post about this and, and uh, you know, share with everyone um, where you see some of your projects. So I encourage you to actually come to your keyboards and fill this in right now. And I'm going to leave this slide up there to let you have the opportunity to answer that while we go ahead and start taking our, our questions. And, and uh, a lot of really good questions have come in here. And so um, let me just start with this, this first one. And uh, Chris, let me direct this question to you. you know, as always, Peggy, feel free to join in. Um, but someone's asking that you know, how do we get users to stop using paper and just to adopt the technologies and, and all the cool th you know, features and functionalities that these technologies bring? Um, so, Chris, just it seems like a simple question, but it's it's not always a simple answer. That's exactly right. We get that question quite frequently. We walk out from a user acceptance that UAT process we think is quite important because we know users are going from what we call the desk that they're normally accustomed to to the desktop. We walk at them with similar functionality. We're not taking necessarily away from them either. We take a landman in the oil and gas space. They want to touch and fill that paper, right? Well, we don't re restrict them from being able to print out if they wish and, and highlight and mark up that particular piece of paper if they want to. Ultimately, it will be shredded at that point unless they need to make a changes. We definitely want to optimize the end solution to be able to do those add, delete changes and notes within the platform application itself. Great question, though, and we definitely work with those end users to get them comfortable moving from the desk to the desktop. I think I would just add, Teresa, that mm -hmm. I don't think we're going to have a choice anymore because it's our customers that are demanding that we offer a digital 
solution in replace. So, you know, things might be ugly on the back end uh, if people want to hang on to their paper, but I think they'll uh, they'll be forced to reconsider digital. You know, for years we at AIM always said, be careful that the paper you push out to your customers are going to come back to you. So try not to push out paper and offer a digital contract signing solution or forms processing to your customers. And when, uh, you know, the paper doesn't come back to you, you'll get used to it. Thanks, Peggy. Um, the next question here, um, and actually, Chris, I want to it's direct it to you because there's some questions about the case studies that you were sharing. And uh, this person is asking, were the documents processed limited to new documents, or were they the old existing um, already produced properties um, in, in lease files? Yes, <laughs> is the correct answer. Uh, it's both, right? It's those archival historical documents that you need to bring in. Uh, from a back office historical compliance standpoint, as well as the day forward processing. So we work with both within an organization to make sure you're in compliance to be able to bring in both the back file and also to manage the day forward processes. Uh, Peggy, I want to start with you for this next question, and then um, Chris, feel free to join in. Um, and actually, it's, it's a, I'm bringing a couple of questions together here. In with all of our discussions of, of digital transformation, um, what would be a good baseline kind of definition that uh, someone can use for sharing with their organizations and, and have that be that common definitional goal? And then along with that, what, what's the first step in that digital transformation journey? Wow, um, that's wonderful because we approach this from a variety of different ways. But more recently, I heard a MIT researcher talk about organizations having a need for a digital services backbone and an operational excellence backbone. And I bring that back to what I said at the beginning, that in all the different ways we define digital transformation around aspirations, meaning what are you ultimately wanting to achieve, because that's the most important thing, it does start with the customer. And some Forbes research that was shared with us said, think about that word easy. Digitally transformed organizations make it easy to do business with them. So that's where I took it a little further and thought, well, what in the world does easy mean? And I think it does come back to those two things. One, the product or the service that you are offering can't be lame. It's got to do something of value. That's, that's how we all get disrupted if we don't. Think of Uber completely upending the taxi um, industry because it wasn't as easy as it could be to hail a taxi. Um, the second is how are you going to deliver that? I would suggest to our wonderful person that, ans that asked that question, you have to almost pick one because you can't do both at the same time. So are you gonna focus your efforts on designing that next product and service? And what are all the technology tools you need in order to do that? Or are you gonna optimize what you're already offering and deliver it in a better way? Pick one at a time, and that's the best way to get started. Peggy, when you mention pick one at a time, we see that a great deal with organizations too. I'm not sure if they want to start with the back file, the day forward. Where do, where do we even begin? That's one question they begin to ask us when we go in to have these discussions, what we call those digital transformation workshops. Good place to start, we always recommend, is those archival documents, right? Those that are important to you. Import those in the system with a BPO conversion process, ingest them into the system. Get the users comfortable with the interface with just simple search and retrieve, right? We go through that walk, run, crawl, walk, run methodology, right? Let's crawl through a few files you can search and retrieve. Then let's look at a larger sample set before we bring in the whole uh, contract life cycles that you have within your organizations or your AP documents within the organizations. But it's very important, as you mentioned, it's that value, that ease of use, and that operational excellence to make sure that it's fully adopted within the organizations. Because bottom line, if it's not easy to use for the end user, adoption is 
I wouldn't say impossible, but it's quite difficult. Thanks, Chris. Um, just wanted to mention uh, a little bit about AIM training because uh, we're getting close to the end of our webinar time here today. Um, you know, AIM offers live instructor-led training as well as online self-paced classes on a variety of topics. And we can even arrange for a trainer to come to your place of business and provide a custom perspective of our instructor-led programs. Uh, there's also um, AIM's Certified Information Professional, or CIP certification. And this certification is dedicated to enhancing and promoting the profession of information management. And then one other really cool thing is we have a, a, an updated class that came out earlier this year, the Fundamentals of Intelligent Information Management. And not only is it a really helpful overview of all things IIM, but it's also an excellent review to prep for that certified uh, information professional exam. So all of this can be found at aim.org slash training, and there's a bunch of different links on there to uh, direct you to a variety of different ways that you can uh, take advantage of the uh, training and uh, certification offerings that we have. Um, and since we are uh, just about at the end of our webinar, uh, time today, just a few last reminders. Uh, we have been recording this webinar, and you can catch it here again when we get the replay posted out there. And we will be e emailing everyone the link to the replay. So I encourage you to come back and listen to it again, or invite your colleagues to listen to this. Uh, please download the resources. Uh, the resources, um, As uh, Chris outlined, there's a lot of really cool things there. Please take our feedback survey. And also very much I would like to thank our underwriter, Konica Minolta Business Solutions. Without the support from our solution providers, AIM wouldn't be able to bring you our free educational programs like our webinars. So thank you very much for your sponsorship. And as we bring this webinar to a close, I just do want to leave everyone with our speakers' closing thoughts today. So I'm going to begin first with uh, Chris Loy from Konica Minolta, your closing thoughts today. Yeah, we trust you found this webinar informative, worthwhile, along with educational, right? Strongly encourage you to review the data that Peggy provided from AIM regarding challenges facing organizations, you know, especially working faster and smarter in that digital transformation journey. And even ask yourself as we go into your organization for your 2020 goals, it's hard to believe, as you mentioned earlier, it's almost 2020, but again, take a look at that. What are your top five digital transformation projects for 2020? Thank you, Teresa. Thank you, Chris. Well, thank you, Chris. And Peggy Winton from AIM, your closing thoughts today. I think uh, that's really good advice, Chris, because you can't boil the ocean. And I, we always say take one process that is doable but not trivial and start there. And if I could give one piece of advice for all of you that is completely technology agnostic, start asking and start training your colleague, uh, colleagues and your coworkers to ask why. Why are we doing this and why are we doing it this way? And I think you'll be surprised, pleasantly surprised, uh, at how that can stimulate uh, new ways of thinking. And then the technology can help you get it to scale. Thank you very much, Peggy. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today for AIM. This is Teresa Resick, and we'll see you with our next webinar. Have a great afternoon. <laughs>